Hello everyone, I believe you're doing okay. So I'm pretty sure by now you must have heard of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, right? So and you've seen this standard version of it that looks something like this, right? H bar over 2. You can subsume this uh, 2 factor in the H bar, it does not really matter. But if you've looked at this particular principle and you know what it really means, well then congratulations, you have understood a very very well complicated phenomenon in physics although it, it's really not complicated rather than being non-intuitive. Uh, classically, it makes sense, you know, if you know something uh, where it is and then you can determine how fast it is or if it is at rest. But in the, in the quantum mechanical world, things don't really behave in a classical sense. Of course, it's a quantum world. They behave in, in the wavy nature, you know, they don't have a single nature associated with them. They behave as a matter or as a particle and as a wave at the same time. Well, it depends on the observer what they're really trying to observe. Today, instead of doing the classical derivation, instead of doing the you know standard derivation where we sit down and write down the quantum mechanical variational principle, where we write down the variance of uh, these things that are then written down as operators, position and momentum, we are today going to do this with the Lagrangian uh, uh, mechanics. And instead of doing everything with operator algebra, instead we are going to write this down uh, using only the classical um, canonical way that Lagrangian would do it and of course this is not rigorous enough for you to get the actual feel of what they're doing but once you see the result things would make a lot more sense than they would um, if you start out with the algebra itself because it, it gets too complicated sometimes uh, although it, it is straightforward but in, in a first glance it might not make a lot of sense so okay so we'll start down by considering that our Lagrangian which is just a term that consists my uh, total energy, let's say total energy being the potential energy and the kinetic energy, you can put a plus sign or a minus sign, it's a matter of convention. I'm going to say that this Lagrangian is a function of two things, one of them being my general coordinates and one of them is the derivative of these general coordinates, okay? And now I'm going to write down the rate of change of this Lagrangian and uh, for the time being I'm going to assume that this is not a function this is not a function of time, there are no time dependencies and if there are any time dependencies, they are implicit in these general coordinates and their derivatives. So the time derivative of this thing or the change of the Lagrangian then would simply be del L over del Q i and then you would have Q i dot over here plus del L over del Q dot i and a double dot over here which is the double derivative of the general coordinate right so this makes sense now what we're going to do is the following we are going to use the euler lagrange equation to generalize this to hamilton's principle and the euler lagrange equation although it looks a bit complicated if i write it down in the four vector formulation but we are not going to do that we are going to write down the euler lagrange equation in the most simple form in the most straightforward form that you can ever see and well, if I'm being precise, it simply looks like delta S is equals to zero, but this is in terms of the action principle and we want to write it down in the Lagrangian form, right? So it would be del L over del T, or if I uh, just, uh, if I do it in the following way, del over del T of del L over del of del T of X minus del L over del X equals to zero. And once we have this, we are going to substitute this thing into our variation of Lagrangian as a function of time and see where this takes us. But before doing the, fo the following, uh, instead of taking x over here, I will take a general coordinate. Instead of taking x over here, I will simply write it down in terms of the general coordinate. This simplifies my life further on. And also, I will define the canonical momentum. I will have the canonical momentum. It's just it's nothing, it's just a fancy word to write uh, momentum in general coordinates, which I call P of I as del L over del Q I dot. And here I replace this whole thing of as D over DT del L over del Q I dot minus del L over del Q I equals to zero. Then as you can see clearly, this thing um, would simplify to the following. It would be written down as d over dt of pi qi dot uh, 
minus the Lagrangian equals to zero. Now let us pause for a minute and try to make sense of this thing. Does it really uh, seem as natural as it does to someone as you know someone writing down for the first time? So look at this expression, this particular expression right over here. Okay. So if I have this expression and I try to um, simplify it or subsume it into something smaller, it would look as as follows. So let me just write it down here again. Uh, one second it should look as follows so here I would have d of dt del L over del qi qi equals to well d over dt of L now just ponder for one second that this is simply the, the chain rule applied to the whole thing right you take the derivative of the first term leave the second term intact and take the derivative of the second term and leave the first term intact. So essentially we have done nothing and simply applied the chain rule. And once you do that and you compare this equation with this equation, you essentially arrive at this equation. Now here in this equation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a new quantity called the Hamiltonian. And then that is going to be, well, uh, a function of these general coordinates and the Lagrangian. So the Hamiltonian uh, for this a continuous system there are no discrete things here uh, classical systems are generally very very continuous and smooth so i will have and since there are no fields involved here i am simply dealing with um, my general coordinates and and, and, I, and i have not generalized anything to say higher dimensions my hamiltonian would look like this right and this makes sense well uh, let's try to see if the the Hamiltonian is related or the change in Hamiltonian if at all it is related to the uh, to the change in the Lagrangian and I leave it to you as an exercise to try to compare that the change in the Hamiltonian as a function of time is negative of change in the Lagrangian as a function of time and we can do this simply um, by finding the variation in this Hamiltonian uh, that we have just defined okay and that would come out to be delta of h or del of h as p i q well the change in q i right plus the change in p i p i being the ith coordinate or the ith momenta q i the reason i call it coordinate is because i can transform my system from one uh, coordinate space to other coordinate space that is i go from the momentum space to position space and general coordinate space and so on and so forth i can do these things and since my lagrangian is also a function of these general coordinates and its derivatives i would have delta l or del l over del q i and the derivative or the change in q i minus del l over del q i del l over del uh, qi over here and the change in del qi fine this also seems to make some sense now if you see uh, a bit carefully here this term and this term are equivalent since i have defined my general uh, you know canonical momentum to be del l over del qi so these terms essentially cancel out and once they cancel out i am only left with these terms and the change in my hamiltonian comes out to be delta P i q i dot minus del L over del q i delta q i. Now, if you simply compare this change, if you simply sit down and compare this change with the general change in the Hamiltonian, if I call it to be a function of P i and q i dot, or if I just say, you know, uh, since it's a derivative, I can say it to be a function of P i and q i only then I would have the change in the Hamiltonian as del H over del Pi delta Pi plus del H over del Qi delta Qi. And if you see and compare this equation, these two equations, well, let's say, let's call this equation number one and call this equation number two. You compare, you compare one and two and when you do that, you arrive at something very simple. And it's a very powerful relation that you arrive at is that del H over del Pi is equals to the time derivative of the Qi or the general coordinate. And del H over del Qi is equals to minus Pi dot. 
And these are some very interesting relations because if you simply have the Hamiltonian and you find the derivative of the Hamiltonian uh, with respect to the canonical or the uh, general momentum, it simply is the time derivative of the ith uh, general coordinate. And if you do the other thing uh, the way around, you find the derivative of the Hamiltonian as a function of the general coordinate. It comes out to be negative of the uh, time derivative of the uh, general momentum. And this is really powerful because once you have some examples and have some fields written down, you don't have to really solve the Euler Lagrange equation. You can simply solve Hamilton's equations of motion. And these are those Hamilton's equations of motion. Sometimes these are really helpful and saves a lot of time. So these are essentially Hamilton's equations of motion okay and this what we had over here is Euler's equation of motion uh, I suppose it's somewhere here this is Euler's equation of motion also called the Euler Lagrange equation all right so now the real thing the, the thing that we've the thing that we've been waiting for for a while is uh, to deal with uh, the, the change or the, the commutation relation between uh, two quantities in these general coordinates and how to arrive at the uncertainty principle and how it comes out to be very natural in this whole construct. So let me define uh, what we call to be uh, the Poisson brackets, okay, the Poisson brackets and I will denote them by these curly braces and underscore pb okay so the poisson bracket between some quantity a comma b okay a comma b is going to be defined as the following it will be the change in a as a function of change in qi or as a function of you know qi coordinate and then delta b pi minus the change in a delta pi the change in b and delta qi so this is essentially what I define my Poisson bracket to be. Now consider any function which depends on these coordinates qi and pi. So the rate of change in that function f, which is a function of pi and qi, if at all is it is also a function of time, uh, let's say for the time being it is a function of time, would be the following. It would be df over dt. It would be del f over del t, since it is a function of time, plus del f over del qi qi dot plus del f over del pi pi dot and you can see from the commutation relations that i simply have del f over del t plus the commutator of f with the hamiltonian and the Poisson bracket right the commutator I, I simply call the commutator to be the Poisson bracket i will uh, refer to this sometimes as the commutator some people call it the anti-commutator but i find this construct a, a little simpler because you know it later on boils down to being the the commutator in quantum mechanics and yeah it's your, it's your choice so if if i simplify my life and say that f is no longer a function of time then the change in this quantity f simply comes out to be the anti-commutator or the commutator or the poisson bracket and this is really interesting because now if you want to find the change in any quantity, all you have to do is find out the change or let's say or is find out the, 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 the Poisson bracket or the relationship of this quantity F with the Hamiltonian and their Poisson bracket. So the consequence of this thing is really interesting. The consequence of this thing is going to be the following. If, well, let's say if these things do commute, or let's say if this whole thing, the Poisson bracket of these things of f with h the Poisson bracket is zero in that event this df over dt is zero and we know if any quantity does not change over time we call it to be conserved right so this is interesting so to find out conservations or conservation laws associated with any quantity in this uh, classical mechanical construction we don't really have to do anything but simply have to find out if this thing is no longer a function of time explicitly and if the Poisson bracket relation of this thing of this quantity f with the Hamiltonian is zero or not and now what we do is this very interesting thing so I'll write down directly what this expectation value change should be now I call this thing to be the expectation value change because uh, I define the expectation value of some quantity uh, f okay in, in, in the quantum mechanical world and the rate of change of this thing 
in the quantum mechanical world is going to be this right it's the expectation value of the commutator of f expectation value of the commutator of f with this thing with the hamiltonian hamiltonian is associated with the energy and since these are all operators in quantum mechanics i put a little hat over them right now if you see the stark relation between the rate of change of the general quantity f in the classical world is simply the anti commutator or the poisson bracket uh, f with the hamiltonian right this is simply this thing and if you just make a bit of a little bit of analogy there is not much change over here you can go out on a limb and say this that the quantum mechanical construction of this anti commutator poisson bracket turns out to be and if i take the expectation value over here turns out to be the following i simply multiply this thing uh, by a little one over i h bar and i have f and h now behaving as operators because in quantum mechanics i associate every observable quantity with an operator function or an operator matrix right so essentially this is what i have and uh, and and there you have it you don't really have to now bother about uh, all those uh, expectation values or the commutation relations in quantum mechanics and write down the the variance and try to generalize the whole thing and use schwartz inequality and what not all you have to do is simply understand what have the hamiltonian is trying to do and uh, if you understand the rate of change of the hamiltonian and try to make certain analogies and put in this extra little factor which might make you a little uncomfortable which we'll try to understand in the next video where we will derive we are going to derive by pure hard work well it's not a lot of hard work once you understand it a pure hard work uh general uncertainty principle let's call that uh, gup it's it's a nice name i call it the gup thing okay the gup thing and it's really nice it's, it's no longer a, a special thing to physics anyway where you have these commutation relations and uh, you associate operators to uh, to observables uh, this gup thing the general uncertainty principle pops up and it, it makes a lot of sense once you understand it so we'll do this following in in the next lecture or in the next video and until then i hope you understand this thing and let me give you a little assignment if you have the time i suppose you should be able to do it it's really fun try to understand uh, uh, what the what the with the result of f being conserved really means in a in a graphical sense and it should give you the following uh, interpretation what you should understand is the gradient of this quantity f and the dot product of f with the with the change of q and p is essentially going to be zero meaning that this quantity is conserved that is the poisson bracket of f with the hamiltonian is zero okay if you can prove this thing it's going to be a really interesting thing uh, because it, it 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 tends to give you a nice graphical representation of how the how this function varies and how its uh, rate of change is with respect to these quantities and if these are orthogonal well the rate of change of this whole thing is orthogonal to this whole vector uh, then essentially uh, this thing just comes out to be a uh, conserved quantity this thing meaning the the quantity f essentially uh, so yeah it, if you're able to do that it would be quite nice and if not we can do this in another video maybe as a corollary to the uh, our next uh, derivation of general uncertainty principle and not only that we will try to understand how this thing generalizes to um, even even energy and time uncertainty relation so until then uh, thank you for watching and i hope to see you next time